In this video, we'll be looking at the war on drugs in the U.S., and we think it'll be helpful if we do this by looking at a case study of the war on cocaine in the 1980s and the 1990s. We'll be using a framework called systems thinking, which will help us look at why cocaine use was so prevalent during that time, and it'll also help us look at whether or not policies administered by the government were effective. So to begin, in the 1980s, cocaine use increased dramatically. The U.S. declared a war on drugs. So when the government wanted to enact policies to stop cocaine use, they really focused on the supply side of things. So they thought about slashing the production of cocaine. They wanted to choke off smuggling of cocaine into the U.S. borders. And they also wanted to create larger penalties for possession and sale. On the demand side, however, they really just told kids, just say no. So did government's policies of focusing on the supply side actually work in mitigating cocaine use? Data showed that arrests for possession and sale of cocaine went up. The data also showed that the number of cocaine-related emergency room visits went up. Also, the number of cocaine-related deaths went up. Finally, the data also showed that the purity of cocaine went up and also the price of cocaine went down. And these two variables are interesting because they usually indicate that this is a pretty competitive market. Only if there are a lot of suppliers that are all producing cocaine do we see them competing with each other to try to attract customers. So it kind of looks like from this set of data that in fact the cocaine market is growing more so than before. In the late 1980s, the National Institute of Justice commissioned Jack Homer to build a system dynamics model to help them understand the problem of the war on drugs. So let's take a look at that model right now. All right, so let's start with the cocaine user population. The main thing that leads people to start using cocaine is peer influence. So we'll add a variable called social exposure to cocaine, and we'll connect it to cocaine user population with an arrow labeled the plus sign to indicate that those two variables move in the same direction. So more social exposure to cocaine leads to more cocaine users. And in turn, more cocaine users increase the social exposure to cocaine. And this leads to a process by which more cocaine users ultimately lead to even more cocaine users as the network of users grows and non-users are more likely to run into cocaine users and start using it themselves, further growing the network. And so this is a reinforcing feedback loop since more is leading to more and we'll label it as the word of mouth loop. Another thing that happens when the population of cocaine users grows is the demand for cocaine increases and this improves the cocaine market. So as the demand increases, we might see a drop in price, we might see innovation, like in the case of crack cocaine in 1981, which was uh, much cheaper, gave a better high, and was also more addictive. These types of things lead to less barriers for users to get their cocaine, there's more dealers on the street, it's cheaper, and so more people are likely to start using cocaine. So here we have two reinforcing feedback loops, and reinforcing loops lead to exponential growth which is a type of growth where growth leads to an ever greater rate of growth. And luckily with any exponential growth process, there are limits to the growth. And in this case, one of the limits is the negative health and social effects of cocaine use. This is a balancing loop, and the balancing loops act to curve that exponential growth that we see resulting from reinforcing loops. And so in this case, we see that the cocaine user population as it increases, there's more sickness and death related to the drug, and over time that leads the public to perceive the health risks associated with cocaine use as being more significant. And so then as the perception of the health risks increase, the cocaine user population decreases. And since a greater cocaine user population ultimately leads to a decrease in the cocaine user population, this is called a balancing loop. And another thing that we start to see happen when the cocaine user population is growing is we see an increase in drug-related crime. And this is another cause for concern, and society pauses and says we need to do something about this. So we'll put more police on the street and we'll increase the severity of the sentences. And it takes a while to rewrite write these laws, but the result of this is another balancing loop that we'll call the clean up the streets loop. It shows that when there's more cocaine users, there's more crime. Because of this crime, we increase the sentence severity. of These two things in combination lead to more arrests and imprisonment, which directly drains the number of cocaine users on the street. And another thing that arrests and imprisonment lead to is an increased perception over time of the legal risks associated with cocaine use. And so this is similar to the perceived health risks loop, 
So as people start to witness more arrests, they say it's risky to use the drug and you're more likely to quit using it and less likely to start using it because you've heard about what bad trouble you can get into if you get caught. So another thing that our society did is intervened on both of these perceived health risks and perceived legal risks balancing loops. We did this through drug education and awareness, and this was the Just Say No campaign. We can introduce this variable Just Say No and link it to the perceived legal risks variable and also link it to the perceived health risks variable. And there's a delay because it takes a while for these children that we're educating to grow into potential drug users and encounter that day where they can just say no and not become a drug user. Another thing that we see when we increase enforcement intensity and sentence severity is an increase in the seizure fraction. And this is sort of a separate policy that's related to the increase in enforcement intensity. And this is where we see an increase in border patrols, keeping drugs out of our country, an increase in police presence in drug-heavy neighborhoods, and they're catching dealers, they're catching smugglers, and they're taking their supply, and this harms the cocaine market and ultimately leads to less cocaine users because there's less access to the drug. This is called the supply disruption loop. So as there's more cocaine users, there's more crime, we protect our borders, we take those drugs, we hurt the market, and this decreases the availability of cocaine to users. Okay, so we've just introduced a number of balancing loops, and this makes sense. When we have uncontrollable growth, a vicious cycle we might say, we'll respond to that by introducing these balancing loops which slow down the growth, which curb it, and have the effect of limiting it. And some of these loops take a while to act, and some of them happen more immediately, and some are more effective than others, and there's some un unintended consequences. For instance, with this, the supply disruption loop, when we increase drug seizures, this will lead to a response from the drug cartels and from gangs to increase smuggling intensity. So when we put up heightened border patrols and border security, the cartels will respond by saying, okay, we know that now we can't get as much of our supply to the end user, so there's a couple ways around that they can ship an even greater amount of the drug to make up for those losses. They might find new routes into the country, or they might use more powerful firearms to fight the border patrols and ensure that they maintain access to the market. One other unintended consequence related to enforcement intensity and sentence severity is that as we increase the enforcement intensity and length of the sentences, and this leads to the increase in arrests and imprisonment. This has a destabilizing effect on the communities that we're arresting these people from. And this destabilization of communities leads to a decrease in income. And if you're in a neighborhood where the best route to employment is to be a drug dealer, this will lead to an increase in the number of drug dealers. So depending on how strong these unintended consequences are, they might lead us to decide that certain policies, such as increasing enforcement intensity or increasing the seizure fraction, are not as good of an idea as we'd originally thought. This model was then used to analyze what was sustaining the cocaine market. And here's what the model found. First, it found that supply-side efforts to crack down on crack didn't really do too much. There's a saying that if you arrest two drug dealers, two more will pop up. And the data supported this. The supply side efforts are represented in this model through the supply disruption loop and the clean up the streets loop. And these are the two loops that didn't do enough because ultimately cocaine user population still grew. But then things began to change in the mid 1990s. The growth of cocaine related medical emergencies and deaths slowed. The number of arrests fell and the net amount of cocaine available in the streets was down to three quarters the level it had been in 1989. So here's what the model shows actually happened. The main reason why the exponential growth of cocaine use in the 1980s finally slowed down in the 90s is due to two key self-limiting negative feedback loops. The first is loop B1, which is that public perceptions of cocaine's health started becoming more realistic. People realized that cocaine had a lot more ill effects than they originally believed in the 1970s. The second reason is that the perceived legal risks of using cocaine began to increase significantly. As prevalence of cocaine was getting higher, so did the number of stories one would hear about knowing someone or having a friend of a friend who got in trouble with the law for using cocaine. So this takes us to our second takeaway, which is that drug use is ultimately self-limiting.
no matter how much the government cracked down on cocaine use by punishing people more, by sending them to jail, it wasn't as powerful as the ultimate balancing loop, which is that people finally figured out, hey, this is risky. Uh, I am more educated about this drug now. We should stop using it. So the problem here, though, is that there is a long delay for the self-limiting aspects to take over. So for example, let's think about when cocaine first came about. Initially, there were a small group of casual users. Through word of mouth, more and more people began using it. But there's a delay between casual users turning into compulsive users. And as we get more casual and compulsive users, there's also a delay there before we get suddenly exponential growth of cocaine-related crime, arrests, medical emergencies, and ultimately death. And it's only through those actions happening that the public starts perceiving all of these negative stories around cocaine, and that's when they realize we need to probably stop taking this drug. Another thing that we saw is that media played an important role. Around this time, comedian Richard Pryor had set himself on fire after using cocaine. Also another story was Len Bias, who was a college basketball star who was celebrating his selection as the top draft pick in the NBA, used cocaine and died from acute heart failure. So these stories were extremely public and they further changed the image of cocaine. The cocaine epidemic was ultimately self-limiting. And there's a pattern that we can see here in that in the beginning of drug use, there are always a lot of positive feedbacks that create strong growth in drug usage. A lot of word of mouth, the market becomes more efficient, price gets cheaper, and we call this period a boom because there's just an exponential growth in cocaine use. But finally, it hits a limit, but there's a long delay before this limit hits where the public perceives that there's a problem and then we get a bust. And the interesting thing is that these boom and bust patterns happen throughout history. We see these same patterns a century earlier in the 1800s. Cocaine first began as medicinal use through injection. And in 1884, Freud had praised cocaine as a cure for opium addiction, alcoholism, fatigue, and depression. Cocaine was even an ingredient in Coca-Cola and cigarettes. And at this time, the market was getting more and more efficient and suppliers were becoming more innovative Suddenly, people are snorting a powder instead of injecting it. In the early 1900s, price of cocaine had dropped enough that it no longer became a product just for the social elites, but the lower social classes were using it too. And during this time, cocaine didn't just have casual users, compulsive users started appearing. And that's when the community starts realizing there's a problem. In 1922, Congress defines cocaine as a narcotic, and they ban importation of coca. And it was around this time people started seeing the negative health effects and the legal risks, and cocaine use began falling. It was self-limiting. We see a boom, and then we see a bust. The problem is when people stopped using cocaine, what they did was they started using other drugs. Then, a couple decades later, we get to the 1980s epidemic, where now we see another boom and bust. And this leads us to our final takeaway, which is that when one problem is solved, another one is created. So when one drug falls out of favor, people turn to other drugs. So when cocaine usage fell in the 1990s, instead we saw a rise in marijuana, in methamphetamine, and in heroin. And the sad thing is that the last heroin boom and bust had just happened 20 years before, and people seem to have forgotten what it was like 20 years ago. And this new heroin boom was supported further by the media, for example, Calvin Klein underwear ads would show models embracing this type of culture. One of the questions we have to ask is, what is the ultimate benefit if policies are too narrowly drawn? For example, if my job in society was to limit cocaine use, and if doing so actually led to greater alcoholism, should I have responsibility there? This shows that the system hasn't been fixed. There's something that leads people to use drugs, to use alcohol, to use other addictive substances, and there are strong reinforcing loops in play that cause people to be stuck in these situations. And how do we make sure that they don't fall into it in the first place? Is it better education? Is it more financial support? Is it more access to social services and community health? More opportunities for positive outlets rather than negative ones? What is it? We have to think beyond limiting supply. We have to think about What's the core problem here that keeps a system happening again and again in boom and bust patterns throughout history?